Verse number five. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there. Yet he did not go in. So when John arrives at the tomb site, he stoops down and peers inside without entering. We are told that he sees the linen cloths. Now, there's something very interesting about this whole passage that we can easily miss when we read it in English. There are three different Greek words here used for our one English word, saw. Now, I think this is clearly intentional and significant, as we shall see. Now, the first word here for saw is the Greek word blepo, and it means to clearly see or perceive a material object. So what is it that John, from outside the tomb, clearly sees? So we are told that he clearly sees the linen cloths. Now the Jewish burial custom was to wrap the body in strips of linen, rather like an Egyptian mummy, but of course without the embalming process. Between each layer of linen, you would put spices or various perfumes. Why are the cloths significant? Why is it important that John is seeing these? Remember, Mary had assumed that Jesus' body had been stolen by grave robbers. So there are two important points here to consider. First point, are we to assume that in their haste to steal the body, the thieves would go to the trouble of unwrapping the body first? I would say highly unlikely. Second point, the linen cloths themselves and the spices that was used to anoint Jesus were valuable items. Are we to assume then that thieves would simply leave behind these things of value? Again, hardly likely. Verse six, then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there. So Peter now, arrives on the scene and we see evidence here of his dynamic impetuous nature he doesn't wait and peer in like john he goes inside immediately he too sees the linen cloths lying there now the greek word that is used here for saw is tereo and this word means to contemplate observe or scrutinize what does his careful scrutiny reveal something of very great interest. Some have claimed here that the linen strips had in some way retained the shape of the body that they had previously wrapped. Now this was not that unusual because upon death the body would be washed and then anointed as we said with various spices and ointments. When the spices dried it tended to harden the fabric, the linen and to remove the linen required often some effort and frequently it had to be cut off from the body. But this was not what had happened here. It was as if the body had passed through the linen or if you like evaporated in some way and left them whole and hollow. This is further evidence I would say that thieves were not responsible. If they had gone to the trouble of removing the bandages, again they certainly would not have left them behind. Also, I think it tells us that what we're thinking about here is a very special, unique event. It was very different to what had happened to Lazarus, for example. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, he came out of the tomb still wrapped in his grave clothes. He had to be helped in removing them. So what had happened to Jesus was altogether different. Verse number seven. And the handkerchief that had been wrapped around his head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Now we get another interesting detail here. Part of the Jewish burial procedure was to wrap a cloth, or a towel, or a handkerchief around the dead person's head. This was not lying with the other linen where we might expect to find it, but it was folded and placed in a different location. Again, it points to a deliberate, purposeful act. 
not something that a thief would do in haste or hurry. It was almost as if the owner of the cloth had removed it themselves, having no further need for it, and simply folded it up and put it down. It's a telling eyewitness detail, again, something that you would not make up. Verse number eight. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. So John now follows Peter into the tomb. Here we have the third different word for saw. It's the Greek word Eden, meaning to understand or to perceive the significance of something. So from outside the tomb, John's view was somewhat obscured. But now inside the tomb, the evidence is overwhelming. He can see and perceive the significance of all the evidence. What possible explanation could there be for what he sees? The only explanation is that Jesus is alive. This is what John believes. Verse number nine. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. The physical evidence persuaded John at least that Jesus was alive and it was this fact that he believed. He was at the time unaware of what exactly the resurrection meant because he had not at this time recognized how the prophetic teachings of the Old Testament came to be fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Let's conclude here by asking what exactly does the fact that Christ rose from the dead mean? I'm going to give you six things that it means. Firstly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that we are justified before God. Because of sin, we are separated from a just and holy God. There is nothing that we can do to bridge the divide that separates us. We require someone to step in and correct this situation. Jesus was the one who stepped in. He took our deserved punishment upon himself. God accepted Jesus as our substitute. Now our sin debts have been paid, and therefore we are justified or seen as righteous in God's eyes. The resurrection of Jesus is like a stamp upon a receipt. The stamp now says, paid in full. The resurrection confirms that God accepted Christ's sacrifice for sin on the cross, and it gives us a right access and a right relationship with him. Secondly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ shows that Jesus' death defeated death. Death is the enemy of mankind and the just punishment for each person's individual sins. When Jesus rose from the dead, he showed that death had lost its hold. It is something that we no longer have to fear. Thirdly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that believers are united with Christ. When we believe in Christ, we are united to him in faith. This means that when God looks at us, he does not see our unrighteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. It also means that because we have died with him, we also will live. Fourthly, the resurrection of Jesus proves the gospel to be true. The fact that Jesus is alive today means that he is able to save today. The resurrection is not only a fundamental part of the gospel, but it is the very glue that holds every part of the gospel together. Without it, Christians are believing in vain and are truly without hope. But since Christ has been raised, we have hope of having our sins forgiven, being made right in God's sight and having eternal life through Christ. Fifthly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that Jesus is the Son of God. If Jesus would have died and remained dead, he would be like the millions who went before him and the millions who came after him. But that is not what happened. Christ's resurrection proves that he is someone of unique status. He is who he claimed to be, God in the flesh. And finally, point six, 
The resurrection of Jesus Christ means that we will be raised like him. Christ is described as the first fruits of the resurrection from the dead, meaning that his resurrection is the precursor to the resurrection that all believers will experience. Christians have the hope and expectation that we will enjoy the resurrected life just like Christ did. So in conclusion, on Resurrection Sunday, we have so much to be thankful for. If you pause for a moment and consider what God did for you, it's beyond comprehension. Take a moment to think on it now, if you will. Jesus determined to give up his place of honor and glory in heaven and condescended to become a man. He lived in poverty and squalor upon this earth. He came as a suffering servant, not to serve people who were good or deserving, but instead for wretched, wicked people like you and me. He was mocked, abused, tortured, and eventually killed by the people he came to save. He died in agony upon a cross because of his love for us. So not just on Resurrection Sunday, but every day, fall to your knees and thank God for sending us a Savior. Would you please join me in prayer? Loving Father, we thank you that you deemed us worthy of saving. We thank you for sending us your Son, who took our sins upon himself and died upon the cross. We thank you that death could not hold him, and on the third day he rose again. We look forward with hope and anticipation to the fact that we too will rise again in glorified bodies to live in joy in your eternal presence. Until that time, please bless us and keep us strong in the faith. We pray these things in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me close by giving you a blessing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead. Go now with Christ's blessing to love and serve the world. Amen. Mm -hmm.